Well, good morning, church. Are you with me today? Are we alive? Are we awake? Good, good. Because we are at the tail end and the culmination of our sermon series, Love First. If you're visiting with us or you're checking us out on Facebook Live this morning, we want to welcome you and say that this is a place for you and we're really glad uh, that you're here. And I think you're, you're checking in at a really opportune time because we're talking about the essence of who we are as First United Methodist Church and what God is calling us to be about here in the Cedar Valley. We've been talking about our new mission and vision statement the last four weeks, and I hope you know it at nauseam now. And it's what? Say it with me if you know it. Love first. Let's gather, grow, go together. So the last four weeks, we've been breaking that vision statement apart and looking at what does it mean to love first? What does it mean to gather for inspiring and life-changing worship? What does it mean to grow primarily through small group ministry? What does it mean to go as servant leaders and aesthetic hospitality to to a broken and hurting world? And today we talk about what does it mean to do that together? Because you are not created as isolated individuals. You are created in the image of a triune God whose very essence is based upon relations of love. And that's where we're going today as we wrap up this series. As I've been preparing for this message, I had a really solid, solid sermon to give you. Uh, And it's been ready to go since Thursday. It's just been kind of baking and on hold. And then I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning. And God did something really annoying. (laughs) He said, Matt, that's a good sermon, but it's not the sermon you're going to preach this morning. (laughs) And he laid on my heart to go a different direction. I've been reading a book called Letters to the Church by a very popular preacher named Francis Chan. Now, Francis Chan and I don't agree on everything theologically, but Francis grew a megachurch uh, in, in very short time. He, he started pastoring when he was 21 years old and grew a congregation that began meeting in a house to thousands and thousands of people gathering every, every Sunday. And as he was having a very, what he thought was a very... Um, impactful and fruitful ministry, he began to realize that the church had become institutionalized, that he was leading, that we were more concerned about the building, we were more concerned about, you know, theological bureaucracy than we were, than they were about reaching their community, than they were about changing souls and, and winning souls for the kingdom of God. And I, I, I commend this book to you because Francis resigned as the lead pastor of one of the largest churches in the United States. And he said, we have so much money and overhead wrapped up into the institutional church. Maybe there's a different way that we could be looking at doing church. So he started with a couple of leaders that he had evangelized to meeting in a house again, the way his church actually formed. And then once those group of of leaders began to become discipled and and leaders developed out of that, they split that house meeting to another house. And they're they're meeting in houses all over across the geographical region in which he's ministering into now, and they don't own a building. And yet this is a congregation of thousands and thousands of people that have gone back to the basics of what community and what being in church together is really about. And I want to read you the opening of his book, Letters to the Church. And I I want you to invite yourself in the middle of this. And this is uncomfortable for some of you, but I'm going to, this isn't going to be a comfortable sermon this morning. I'm not here to cuddle you as your pastor, right? My job, and Pastor Scott said this well, and it's not his original thought. There was another popular preacher who said this, but the job of a preacher is to comfort those who are afflicted, And sometimes it's to afflict those who are just darn right too comfortable. And I challenge us this morning that as the church, and I'm not just talking about this particular faith community, but I'm talking about the church with a capital C. Have we become too comfortable? Have we become too comfortable? So I want to invite you to do something uncomfortable. I want you to close your eyes with me. And I want you to hear the the words of Francis Chan. Imagine you find yourself stranded on a deserted island 
with nothing but a copy of the Bible. You have no experience with Christianity whatsoever. And all you know about the church will come from reading your Bible. How would you imagine a church to function? Seriously. Close your eyes for just a moment and try to picture church as you would know it according to the Bible. Now, don't miss this. He goes on to say, now think about your current church experience. Is it even close? And then he phrases the question, can you live with that? (laughs) Is it even close? And can you live with that? Who's uncomfortable already? (laughs) maybe a little bit that's good that's good I want to talk about church the essence of church what it means to be a gathered community that's together that's together and I want to take this back to the very essence of who God is okay because sometimes we get confused we follow this doctrine of the one God is what it's called And it's a false doctrine where we think that God is on high and somehow beneath God sits sits Jesus on a little bit lower um, hierarchical scale. And then we have some mention of the Holy Spirit sprinkled throughout our faith journey. And and God is the one who's in charge and and it's all about God, God, God. And we pray, Lord, Lord, Lord. And I just want to say that's not the essence of the Christian faith. That we worship a God who is Trinity, say Trinity, please. Trinity. Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that are all involved in each other's activity constantly throughout the entire history of time. There's no hierarchical levels of God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Greek, we call this perichoretic activity. Right? That Jesus is homoousios, meaning of one being with God and one being with us. That everything that Jesus does is a window into who God actually is. And none of the persons of the Trinity, while they have unique function, act independently of one another. Does that make sense? I mean, that's like a, very, that's like a four-week crash course of what the Trinity actually is. But this is the God in whom we worship. Not a deity of a one God, but a one God in three persons. And the very essence of who God is, is based upon these three relations. These three relations of love, humility, and self-deference to the other persons. Look at John chapter 5, verse 22. Jesus tries to explain this to us. Now, I got to tell you if, you, if you do the concordance method of reading the Bible and you try to look up Trinity and try to find that word in Scripture, it doesn't exist, right? The word Trinity is not mentioned anywhere in Scripture, but God's Trinitarian activity is on every single page of your Bible, Jesus puts it like this. He says, the Father entrusts all judgment to the Son. Now, my dad has sons, (laughs) two of them. He does not entrust all judgment to me. Let me clarify. And I know he's watching live stream right now, and he's saying the loudest amen of all of you at the moment. (laughs) Right? I, my dad was explaining to me, I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of getting up there in age, and a few years ago, he had to have a heart procedure, and he was talking about updating his living will. It was a very weird conversation to have with him. And, and I said, you know, it felt kind of like a prodigal son, because I was like, Dad, you know, if you don't make it, how much do I get exactly? <laughs> and he says, oh, oh son. <laughs> You know, I, I do not trust you with your inheritance. In fact, it's going to be broken up in multiple installments to you for the rest of your life. You're not getting it all in one lump slum. My dad does not trust me with my inheritance, much less all judgment. <laughs> all right? But Jesus says to the disciples, the Father entrusts all judgment to the Son. 
And then, so he's talking about the activity of God and the relationship that God has with the Son. Now look at John chapter 6. Jesus says, I have not come to do my own will, but I have come to do the will of the one who sent me. You see how the Father points to the Son, and now the, now the, now the Son is pointing back, back to the Father. And he goes on in, in John 15, go to the next one. He says, when the Spirit comes, it will not come to bear witness to itself. Can you go to John 15? Do we have that one? There we go. When the advocate or the spirit whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who goes from the father, he will testify about me. So when the spirit comes, it will not come to bear witness to itself. It'll come to bear witness to me. So what you have is this grounding of these Trinitarian relationships of love that are grounded in humility, self-deference, and service to one another. There's not this hierarchical construct of the one God, but this God of three persons who's essence is relations of love. Relations of love. That is the God in whom we worship. A God who is at, its, at God's very core is grounded in relationship. And this is the image in which you bear. This is the image in which you are created. In relations of love. We were never created to be solitary individuals. But we are, we are not living into our, our fullness of who we were created to be as, as humans and, and as Christians apart from quality relationships with one another. Are you tracking with me? I'm not being too heady or theological, right? We're not living to the fullness of our personhood if we're not in authentic relationship with one another. What we find in the Trinity is that there's no hierarchical relationship at all. What we find is relations of love, of self-deference and humility towards one another. And to be created in the image of a triune God is not to be created as a solitary individual. Jesus says, they will know they are my disciples by being the omnicompetent individual. Right? No! <laughs> it doesn't say that anywhere. What does it say? They will know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. The image of God is communal, not manifested in individuality, but in relationships. You know, it's not coincidental that the early church had no plan for evangelism. Do you know that? There was no marketing strategy. There was no program. There was no gimmick. There was no box kit that you buy from Cokesbury and grow your church. It didn't happen that way. Here's what did happen. They had such an astounding quality of community with one another that they couldn't help but attract people. I mean, I want to bring that Acts passage up again. I want you to read this with fresh eyes in light of what Francis Chan has asked you and in light of knowing the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity and noting that you are not created to be a solitary individual, but you are only at your best when you're in relationship with one another. And I want you to read again what, what real authentic Christian community looks like. Bring up Acts chapter 2 again for me. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Read it with me. And the Lord added to their, daily, to their number daily... <laughs> I, man, <laughs> you're much better readers of scripture than I am. <laughs> Did you see the quality of their community manifested in loving relationships towards one another? Where they were gathering in each other's homes, where they were breaking bread, where they were attending to worship and prayer, where they were bringing the deeds to their property? And laying it before the church in such a way that there would be no one in need amongst them. This is a radical, radical 
countercultural kind of love. They had such a quality of community that the world couldn't resist these kind of relationships. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Do you think that if the North American church had that kind of thing going on, that we would be shrinking in America? Do you think the North American church would be facing the problems it's, it's facing today if, if the quality of our community and fellowship was based in humility and self-deference to one another that the world just simply could not resist it? Do you think we'd have problems attracting visitors to the church? Are you mad at me yet? Are you getting a little uncomfortable? That's good. <laughs> That's okay. I had a seminary professor who once said that he didn't believe that some churches should be involved in evangelism at all because the quality of the community in which they foster is so poor that it's not worth exporting to the world, he said. Perhaps some of you have been in churches like that. I had a classmate who went on to do doctoral work on Christian community and he wrote a thesis on Christian community and home brewing. <laughs> Can you believe that? And the entire thesis of his paper was that we can, that oftentimes people can find more authentic community and relationships sitting on a bar stool amongst strangers than they can amongst their own local churches in which they've been members of for most of their lives. He said, sometimes we find more quality of community and, and better relationships at a sporting event amongst strangers because we're all of one mind, right? And we all have a common goal and we're all cheering and motivated and moving to the same purpose. You see, when we begin to manifest something of love that we see in the book of Acts, the church will have no problem attracting visitors, and evangelism just simply becomes an overflow from the community and the quality of relationships in which we're experiencing. I'm challenging you today, my friends, because I believe in North America, we have forgotten what the church is in many ways. We are the body of Christ, my friends. And we're called to manifest such loving relationships, such loving relationships that people come to be disciples by the way in which we love one another. And these relationships are based upon the relations of love we experience with the triune God himself. This is a community that is so countercultural. It is so in the world, but not of the world, that the world cannot help but be drawn into it. And I'm fearful that the mentality of many Christians, and even some pastors, is that we have become a church of individuals that are consumer-driven. For many, the church has just become one more institution in which to come and consume spiritual goods and services you know, there's a staff person who does this. You know, someone else will take up the mantle of, of extending that ministry or that need. I'm just here to have my, I, I just went to church to meet my needs, they'll say. And the church actually doesn't exist to meet your needs. <laughs> it exists to meet the needs of the world. But what happens when we do church this way? We have to put together slick programs and, and clever marketing campaigns and, and strategies. But this was never the vision of the New Testament church. Now, I'm not saying that marketing and evangelism is bad in of itself if you have a quality of community and fellowship that's worth exporting to the world, right? So, where, how do we do that? How do we build that kind of community? How do we build this kind of fellowship that is so faith and fire filled that the world just simply cannot resist it? 
we talked about this a couple weeks ago. It actually happens in a small group, my friends. It happens in a small group. This is why John Wesley, I believe, was an absolute genius, the founder of the Methodist movement, because most Methodist churches have become a gathering that meets on Sunday morning, and if you feel like it, join a small group. You know, we'll offer this particular Bible study, you know. The Methodist movement didn't begin that way. The Methodist movement was a movement of small groups that met to worship on Sunday, not a gathering group on Sunday that occasionally did small groups. Because it's in a small group where you're tending to one another's soul, where you're in circles of, of, of six to ten people, where you can begin the real hard work of growing in your faith. Where you're not doing that alone, when you're invested relationships with one another, and you're being held accountable to the standards of God, not in, based in judgment, but based in love. You know, I, I can't go up to someone I don't know well and, and give them correction in their faith because it's not based in a relationship. It comes across as judgment, not love, right? The only way you can speak that kind of truth into someone's life is if you are invested in them, is if you're in relationship with them. It's our dream here at this church that you just don't come to church on Sunday morning. You know why? Because there's something powerful that happens in circles that just doesn't happen in rows. Are you hearing me, church? That's where community is going to be built. That's where you're going to experience that kind of fellowship. That's where you're going to experience that kind of edification in your own faith. It's in small group ministry. If you're not involved in one of these... Come talk to one of your pastors. Let's begin a new one together. You know, in a, in, in a church our size, everybody wants to know everybody, but that's just simply not possible in a church our size. But everybody needs to know somebody <laughs> that can invest in you and that can grow you in your faith. But you have to know somebody to have that kind of gospel witness manifested in your own, in your own life. I experienced the church being the church. Where we were gathering together, where we were of one mind, and we experienced no one in need amongst us. Yesterday, uh, I proved that though I'm follically challenged, I can still pull off a hairnet. Can you bring up that picture? Oh, there it is. Isn't that flattering? <laughs> Yesterday in this very room, there was almost 100 of us that gathered together to pack meals and prepare meals for 30,000 people that were in need. Dozens of you gathered yesterday to accomplish this work. Go to, the ne go to that next picture. This room was a flurry of activity of people gathering together in mission together. And by the end of the afternoon, there was 30,000 meals that were, that were prepared. This is just a, one of the pallets that went out to, the, one, to one of the trucks that left this morning with that food. You know, I want to be a part of a church. I want to be part of a movement that does things like that, you know? When we gather regularly together in each other's homes, where we lay our possessions before one another so that there's no needy persons amongst us when we're gathering and tending to prayer and scripture. And maybe, just maybe, in a fellowship of that kind of community, the Lord would add to our number daily those who are being saved. I'm not the only one who can pull off a hairnet. <laughs> there's a hole in her smile this week. She lost her first tooth. Addison's job yesterday on the assembly line was putting stickers, dated stickers, on these food packages. And I said, when we got home, I said, Addison, wh why, did, why did you want, I mean, she was excited to come and do this when we were telling her what we were going to do and we were going to help people and feed, feed people. And she says, when I do stickers, it makes God smile. That's what she said. And I said, yes, Addison, you did that. And you know what she said? She said, no, Daddy, we did that together, together. She gets it. 
being together in relations of love, a place where we gather in each other's homes, a place where we tend to worship and prayer, a place where we break bread together, a place where we lay our possessions down at the feet of one another, then and only then, when we have that quality of community that's manifested in the very relations of the triune God itself, will he add to our number daily those who are being saved. Because they will not know we are Christians by our individuality, my friends, but they will know that we are his disciples by the way that we love one another. Let's love first. Let's love first. As we gather, as we grow, and as we go, for the sake of the gospel, my friends, let's do it together. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the First United Methodist Church in Cedar Falls. We're glad you joined us. We're here to help you on your journeys of life and faith. We gather for worship services and classes, support groups, and just for fun groups. And you're welcome at any one of them. Just show up and say, hi, I'm new here, and we'll take it from there. You can learn more about our church at aboutfirst.com. And you can follow us on Facebook and YouTube, too. If you can't make it in person, we'll be right here on your TV at this same time next week. We'll see you then.